Hello and welcome to The Whistleblower. This is the program for the water polo community that focuses largely on refereeing, but also on other things of interest in our great game. My name is Ian Trent and joining me is today's super brilliant panel from the nation's capital. He's not there tonight. It's, I thought it was going to be cold in Canberra, but it's even colder in Orange where Noel Harrod joins us. Hi, Noel. He's joining us, but I can't hear him. I think Noel's on mute. Noel is on mute. It could be my bandwidth. Can you hear me now? All right. Your bandwidth okay. has changed. Uh, yeah, it's quite it's not so good here. Yeah, it's uh, Hello, pretty, co pretty cold in orange, mate. It really is. I thought it was cold in Canberra. One degree, is it? Or minus one? Oops. That's uh, one, and uh, flaky snow, but yeah. I hope it's a little warmer um, over there in Perth. 3,000 Ks across the Nullarbor, the Australian men's team assistant coach and the coach at WACE. Paul Overman, what's the temperature like over in Perth in the west? Uh, quite warm today. Uh, we've had some storms all last week, so um, it's been a bit refreshing that we've had some blue skies today. Beautiful. Beautiful. And the weather, they say, on the northern beaches is always wonderful, even better today, because Manly got a win last night. Here he is, the former FINA referee and Australian Water Polo Development uh, Director, Scotty Schweichel. Hi, Scotty. Hello, Ian and Danny, Paul. No, I hope you're all well. Fantastic. Looking forward to being on tonight. Yep, and uh, good to have you. And of course, Danny Flav joins us as well over in Collingwood country down there in Melbourne. And uh, Danny, lovely to have you on board. The lovely Lisa actually got you on board, which is great. Yes, uh, thanks, Minnie. Yes, had a bit of trouble uh, logging in, but um, Lisa come to the rescue and uh, here I am. Fantastic. Hi, now, tonight, uh, it's going to be another really good show. Our special guest is the former Australian coach, John Fox. In the meantime, if you have any questions, um, have a look down on your screen, but on below your screen there, the tab Q&A, the Q&A tab, right? If you press that, you'll be able to ask any question you like, whether it's of uh, John, and I'm sure that there are many people who want to ask him uh, a few questions about his uh, storied career in water polo, and, and of course, refereeing anything you like. Uh, that'd be fantastic. The Q&A box, down at the bottom of your screen. Email your feedback as well on whistleblowerpolo at gmail.com. That'd be really good. And of course, our Instagram account, whistleblowerpolo, hashtag, who is so There it is on your screen, all of that now. And that's the lines of communication. Now, some news for the week. I haven't got a lot of news, gents, but normally Paul's got an exclusive or whatever. But the one good thing that happened, Ben Lees was appointed the National Women's Under-20 coach. And uh, I haven't uh, had a lot to do with Ben, but he seems, I, I met him during the year, and he seems like a terrific uh, uh, bloke. I was going to say young bloke, but relative to us he is. But uh, I think it's a great appointment. Yeah, certainly is. Um, Ben's got a lot of experience. Uh, went to the AIS as a as an athlete and started doing his apprenticeship coaching down there and uh, followed through with Irk and Shigaev and uh, was the assistant coach in nineteen uh, sorry in two thousand and four. So he's uh, yeah got lots of experience. Walked went away from the game for a little bit, but um, has come back as the QAS coach and uh, also coached Queensland Thunder to their inaugural premiership, so last year. Oh, I like the way they play. Uh, I attended a few of their games, Paul, and the, and the rest of the panel, and I thought, I don't know if you saw them, but I thought they played pretty good polo, really nice style, and we had a bit of a chat, and um, I like the way he coaches too. He treats them all with, with great respect, and they all seem to like him and uh, perform accordingly. Yeah, no, certainly, and uh, I think also what's significantly helped Ben up there is having um, Bronwyn Knox in the team. Um, lots of experience there. So the, the girls are getting some in-water experience through Bronwyn and some out-of-water experience there through Ben. And uh, being a young, really young group up there, it's uh, yeah, really good for the sport. Okay. Uh, gentlemen and, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, our special guest uh, online waiting for us, uh, John Fox. In the meantime, 
Uh, we're going to go to our rules segment, starring the great Daniel Flav, undoubtedly Australia's top referee, but he's also a great analyst. And it's game time. Rules interpretations with Flav. Okay, that's a cue for me to, to say hi, Danny, again. <laughs> good evening, Minnie. How are you, mate? I'm good. Shrouded in silence here. Thank but you, uh, <laughs> let's have a look at the first of our um, of our clips tonight. And, of course, today we're talking about centre forward, centre back. Let's have a look at it, Dan. Sure. Unfortunately, oh, here we go. No, my... A little bit slow on the uptake. Yeah. Okay. That's very hard to see that one. That really is hard. Yep. As far as, yeah. Let's have a look at the second one. The, f the first one I thought, well, it's just centre back drowning the centre forward and yeah. away. Uh, the first one was actually very well ref and it was play on the, the guy actually scored a goal. Yeah. Um, this one here, it's also very hard because it's, it's, it's not running properly, but it's, the centre back actually impedes the centre forward. It should be an exclusion earlier, and then the ball comes in. And the referee just calls play on. Unfortunately, we can't we can't see that well. No. And believe talk about it. Danny. Is that emanating from you, Noel, or from Scotty? Uh, Ian, it's not from me. I was on mute, mate. I've just come off now, so yeah, right. not me. Scotty, how's your MBN, mate? Yeah, it's not working really well at all, Mini, unfortunately. Too. Daniel, can I ask you a question about centre forward and centre back? Sure, yeah. mate. Might as well let's go through it, yeah. What's, what's the hardest part about refereeing centre forward and centre back? Well, the, the problem at the moment is that because... We, we still like to see the, the wrestling. Uh, the TWPC like to see the centre back and centre forward actually wrestling, jostling, trying to get position. Uh, mm. The thing is that if we let that jostling go too far, um, then as a referee, we, we get ourselves in trouble. Uh, that's because then it starts to get really heavy. And once it gets heavy, it's very hard to bring it back. So um, even though we like the jostling, we've got to keep it clean. So, so basically, it's it's jostling for position to try and you know obviously if you're playing press, you're you're playing in front and and stealing, and if you're playing behind, it's that. But it's not the uh, overly aggressive, you know, grab pull around it, and you know, do you, do you find there that um, I suppose some younger referees find it more difficult refereeing centre forward and centre back? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's a, it's a lot of experience as well. Um, you've got to know when it's, actually, when it's actually got too heavy and too hard, and that's when you've got to call the fouls early. So I might just got to plug in my charger. So Daniel, uh, I'm going the other. They're going the other. We're talking defensively. What about offensively? Uh, the thing that really annoys me watching games. It annoys me as a spectator, but I, I know what's going on. Yep. Holding calls, holding calls on centre forward, centre back, centre forward holding. Uh, all hands are under the water. Uh, no one in the crowd can see much. But yeah. The referee can. Yeah, it's 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 very hard. Look, what, what, how we look at it is that if they're both, if both centre forward and centre back are holding and no one's getting advantage, we normally let that go. But once. Once, a, if a centre forward lets go and the centre back is still holding, well, there's our exclusion because he's taken the advantage away from the centre forward. And then vice versa, if the centre forward's holding the centre back and working away, and the centre forward and the centre back's not holding on, well, there's our contra because the centre forward's actually taking the advantage away from the centre back. So it's all about the advantage. If someone takes the advantage away, either way, it's either got to be an exclusion or a contra foul. But is it what is it what you see or what you think you, is going on? Well, we, we can't. We we have to see it. We just can't call anything that we we can't see. So it's got to be seen to, for us to call it. So and as you said, a lot of the holding and grabbing is done under water, and we can't we can't do we can't have guesswork to think you know what we think. If we can't see it, then we can't call it. Okay. Any other comments from the panel, Noel? Uh, I actually agree with Danny. I um, yeah, one hundred percent agree. 
that's not that's not all that common, but I do agree this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we agree most of the time. You, you're dead right, mate. I 100%. Danny, just another one. Yes. Um, I heard. I have heard this year a lot of comments um, being on the delegates panel there about positioning. And I think positioning for refereeing centre forward and centre back is crucial. We see a lot of referees move down to be directly in line on the two metres with the centre forward and centre back. Yeah. Is that where they should be? Or should they be out further, behind? Where should they be? Yeah. Great question, Paulie. I mean, you've, got to, you've got to give yourself the best position as a referee to see the whole action what's going on between the centre forward and centre back. So if you see, if you're, if you're yeah. the 10 metre line and you're in line with the players, you can't see what's going on. So we need, to, we need for the referees to move forward and backward so they get the best position so they can see the whole, uh, the whole game between the centre forward and the centre back where they are. It's a very good comment, Danny, because um, one, of the, one of the problems I think young referees have is they, they get fixed. They think, I've got to be here, I've got to be on a four metre, five metre, two metre, whatever. They don't realise, they need to feel the game. They need to be able to see what's happening. What happens is we talk to them about when they're following the field down, they should be in front and behind, but they don't, as soon as they get to the four or five metre area, they, they, they stop, they become still. They move the rest of the time, but they don't move then. And that's the most important time to move. Absolutely, yes. The more, the more movement and the following of the play, especially, as I said, on the, on the two metre, centre forward, centre back, moving, moving back to five metres and moving back to two metres, it's depending on which way the centre forwards turn as well, the centre back is have, have positioned. So the referee must put themselves in the best position to see the whole scenario of what's going on. Okay. And, uh, Danny, another one that really annoys me, uh, centre back, really good legs, you can't see any videos, but you can see my arms are up in the air, yes. right? They're up there, great legs, pushing, 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 centre forward from behind, right? And then over the top, and half the time they're allowed to get away with whatever, and uh, yep. two hands up, <laughs> two hands up. Uh, is that the story? No, Gee, well, many, many, you did that so well, you could be a centre back. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> No, it's very hard because also even though, you, even though you've got both hands up and you're showing the referee that you're not holding, actually with your chest, you're actually sinking the centre forward still. So yeah. that's, another, that's another form of impeding. So no matter what, you, you have the best legs in the world, but if you're actually leaning on the centre forward and you're sinking them, then it's a sinking foul, so it's an exclusion. Yes, okay. Well, I'm glad that you think that because half the referees <laughs> in the world don't. <laughs> we're all learning. We're all, we're all, we're all, getting, oh, we're all learning. We're getting there. Right. Uh, Dan, yes. Dan I, I have an observation also about the when refereeing the centre forward and the centre back area. And it relates to when teams uh, are playing playing zone. And the centre forward is trying to slide and, and rotate and move into open up a, a passing lane or a position of advantage for the ball to come in from out the top. And so often you'll see the centre back uh, come from the side and pull him back and rip around to try and take that, that advantage away. Um, Danny, do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I think as soon as, it's, as soon as the centre back actually steals or manoeuvres the centre forward out the way to get an advantage, that's, and that's an illegal advantage, then it has to be an exclusion. Any, any way, any holding to get an advantage or take an advantage away, then that, that's where our exclusion comes into it. You know, look, some, some, some centre backs have great legs and they can slide. That's fine, not a problem whatsoever. If they're not holding, if they're doing it legally, then good luck to them. You know, reward good defence. But if they're holding on and, and manoeuvring the centre forward um, with, with their hands, then that's the exclusion because they're taking the advantage away from the centre forward. And then same for the centre, and same for the centre forward, manoeuvring the centre back out the way as well. Okay, let's uh, go to a couple of audience questions. How do we teach young officials to keep looking at where the hands are of the centre back in the centre forward centre back contest? For example, a lot of young centre backs put two hands or their elbows showing no hands on the shoulders, and nothing is called. That's 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 also another another case of impeding, um, holding el elbows down on the centre forward shoulders, sinking once again. So we need we need to say that's an exclusion straight away. 
So the rules state that if, 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 if you're sinking a player, you're sinking centre forward or a player, then it's an exclusion. So having their hands up, but resting their, resting their elbows on the, on the centre forward shoulders, that's an exclusion. Okay. Oh, well, we sort of half went through it before, but not, not quite maybe. Another question, Danny, how do you judge who is holding and who, who is holding who in the centre forward, centre back contest? Yeah, no, look, <laughs> once again, another great question. It comes down to, we actually let both players hold each other. Centre forward, centre back can hold each other. They can, they can wrestle. Um, but as soon as one player lets go, so the center, let's say the centre forward uh, lets go of the centre back, well, then the centre back must let go as well. But if the centre back continues to hold, well, there, there's, our exclusion, there's our exclusion foul. So we've got to, we've got to look who, who's holding. And if they're both holding, we normally let that go. But if one lets go, the other one must let go as well. So the centre forward holds and lets go, the centre back must let go as well. And then vice I, I think also, Danny, it's, it's really important where the leg of the centre back is. Yes, correct. Whether they're down or they're up. And, yeah, and so not enough referees take notice of that. Yeah. They don't so see who's hot. Yeah. yeah. So normally, as Noel's saying, if the, if the legs are dropped, if, if the centre back's legs are straight down right from the water, they're normally hanging on. Okay. And once again, that is knowledge of the game and how it is played at a high level. Okay, good point there, Noel. Another good point coming up. I'd expect it from this fellow. Another question. Can centre forward go underwater to gain position? Um, when, when this rule first came out, any underwater by the centre forward was a contra foul, was a turnover. Uh, and, we, and we actually did that quite well. Uh, but then the TWPC in... Uh, just, I don't know why, but thinking now that if a centre forward goes underwater and the ball doesn't come into them, then we don't call it. I know it sounds a bit ridiculous, so because the ball can go from our top across to one player, and that player can pass the ball into the centre forward who's ducked underwater. So if they're not getting advantage by ducking underwater, we can let it go. But it's, it's a very, controvers very controversial rule. So, but most of the times, most of the referees are still calling, if the centre forward ducks underwater, to get an advantage or to go around, then it's a turnover. Okay. And that, that is happening in every game, or it was yes. during the National League season, big time. Yep. Okay. Another question coming in. This is good. Um, if you have a question, have a look at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A uh, tab down there, and you can write your question and get it answered by our panel of uh, eminent referees. You said a, a centre-back should be sent out for impeding even when they have their hands up. Didn't get that word up. Surely this is a free throw. No, no. What, what, what I said was if they've got both hands up and their chest, their body is sinking the centre forward, that's an exclusion because they're impeding the centre forward. It's still a sinking foul. Even though they've got their hands up, their body is resting on the centre forward. That's a sinking foul, which is an exclusion. 100 percent i'm sure uh ian paul Scotty, when you coach you teach players to lean to hold to put their hands up because then the crowd everybody expects can't be out they've got their hands up so what their body's doing what they're doing when they're impeding absolutely okay but th that would not include center back just pushing center forward out having better legs no not at all it, it no. being a contest no, that's, that's absolutely fine. Pushing out is fine, no worries whatsoever. But as soon as they sink or impede the centre forward, it's an exclusion. Okay. Absolutely. Very fine line too. Very interesting point to referee. Very what's difficult the, to work that out. Daniel, what's the um, ruling then? So the centre back is clearly stronger than the centre forward. Yes. Okay. And what you'll find is the, the centre forward's pushing back and then the centre back, just through, through sheer pace, pressure, yeah. toughness, whatever it might oh, be, yes. ends yeah. up going over the top because the centre forward now yeah. isn't as strong, those sorts of things. Is, is that a penalty or, or an exclusion? No, no, sorry no, against no. the centre back? No, you, you, can't, you can't disadvantage a guy who, or sorry, any player that's stronger than another player. Um, this is where experience comes into it. The referee's got to know that if, if the player's strong and he's pushing the other player out, then we let it go. And of course, as you said, 
if the centre four is not as strong, they do sink down, and that's where the, the, where the referee's got to be smart enough to know that the centre back's not the centre back's not actually holding them or pushing them underwater. The centre four is just not strong enough to hold his position or, or their position, so we let that go. Let's play on. Okay, if, if you watch national league games, uh, and I've had a, I've, I haven't had an argument. We've had a discussion with people, right? To me, national team players seem to get penalised a little bit for just being physically stronger, having better legs than non-national team players. And I understand why they would have, be physically much better, but they seem to get penalised for being better often. I also acknowledge, Danny, that they cheat better <laughs> because they're more experienced and they're, they're, they're at it. I know that, but it, is it difficult for a referee to to gauge, are they cheating or are they just so much physically better? Look, I, I think myself personally, and, and all referees should do this, that we actually don't referee the player or the person. We just referee to the rules. Simple as that. So I can't say, Minnie, you're the best centre back in the world. You know, so you can get away with anything. It doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't recognise players by their names or anything else. We just, we just referee to the rule, not, not the player. No, uh, and that's all across the pool. Now, I've got to take, fair, this to panel, take this to the panel, right? Do you... So, no, you've been around for a while. Do you look at who you're refereeing at all? I mean, it's hard not to, surely. No, I can... Uh, and there'll be players who don't agree with my comments, but most certainly, I don't referee players who they are. I don't do I may give a big centre forward more advantage, but I certainly don't pick on players who they are. As a matter of fact, what's quite interesting is the amount of times I've been criticised by people for letting national team players get off is a really interesting point after the question was made because I think Danny would appreciate this. We get regularly criticised of you let that person off because that person's a national team player. You didn't actually um, call the foul when you did it. And that's not true either. It's all about being able to call the game as you see it. Right. No. Interesting. Have you done a bit of refereeing? Is it Mini. difficult not to, to judge, you know, a, a national team player or a player that's that you've seen a lot? No, you can't. I, look, I, I've never done that. Um, even though at times it's it's been hard because sometimes you can be uh, uh, they can be a personal friend of yours or uh, in, in in that situation, but. You know, it's it's not in the to me. It's not in the fairness of the game to to favour one over the other, and I'm sure a lot of people are like that. Um, and it's not within the spirit of the rules, as far as I'm concerned. No, absolutely not. Okay, Danny, another question: uh, What do you do as a referee if your partner makes a blunder that denies a team a goal, which could influence the outcome of the game? Okay, in, in this situation, and as, as a referee or the second referee, and you know that the, the call was wrong or, or there was, a, was a, a very large or bad mistake, you actually can stop the game, take the ball out, and then go around and speak to your fellow referee, work out what happened, and then go back and, and make the right decision for it. And it, it, happens, it happens in all level of competition. Um, I've seen it from under 12s, up to Olympics, where they have made a mistake and the ref one referee has called for the ball, gone around and disgusted, it, and then right, righted, righted the wrong and allowed the goal or disallowed the goal. So the best way is to take the ball out. Even if you're right or wrong with other referee and you, you work out that the referee was right in the first place, but you need to take the ball out, discuss what happened, right the wrong, if there was, and then, then start the game again. Okay. Another question. Got any thoughts or ideas on a signal, probably a, a generic signal, to show advantage? Just <laughs> play on. <laughs> One of those. And, yeah, and some, actually some referees, they, they do it now, they actually have two hands and they sort of like, we're, we're forcing the player along. So, but myself personally, I just do this. When, when a player looks at me and I want to give them advantage, I wave my hand and say, go, go, go. Now it's time for our special, special guest. And, of course, it is the former Footscray 
Melbourne Tigers Victorian and Australian representative player and the former Australian men's team head coach, John Fox. Good evening, John. Good evening, Ian, and uh, hi to all the panel. And uh, Noel, I thought you were doing some uh, street talk in Orange there, walking <laughs> around. You might have been trying to uh, get some, uh, get some on the street interviews. <laughs> That's a fair cop, mate. That's a fair cop. <laughs> well, Foxy, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, uh, I did mention that you're, uh, you're a Footscray boy. Can you take us back to the early days of uh, John Fox in water polo at Footscray? Well, it's going back a while and it actually, uh, well, Flavie might fill in any gaps here because um, he was one of the, the players in my very first team at Footscray. And um, under our legendary coach, Ronnie Wooten, who was also a national coach as well. So yeah, that was where I learnt the ropes and basically um, started from high school, went to Melbourne High, that's as a swimmer, and then graduated over the water polo. And um, yeah, state teams, Victoria, and then up to the AIS in 1985 with the inaugural intake, and I've been here ever since, basically. Okay, I'll, look, I'll turn it over to the panel. Noel first. Maybe so, I'll John, it to you you're, because you've, you've been on the trek. Yeah, no, so, John. Compare water polo today to those days when you were in the AIS, the team trained together, um, and, they, and they were good times, in my opinion. Anyway, I should leave it to you. What What do you think of the comparison between now and what was the program then? So you're talking the Australian comparison or how world water polo? The Australian was? comparison as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but also that, how the world's moved on. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for, for better or worse, the, the AIS program was designed to prepare players for the national team. And there was a lot of criticism, maybe that players were there for too long, myself being one of those. But what it gave us was a daily training environment that was very similar to what the Europeans were, were training in. So without the club competition, obviously, we were able to replicate as close to a high performance program that our European counterparts were doing. Um, things have changed a little now and not necessarily it's a bad thing, but, and I suppose we'll get onto this later in preparation for national teams where we've actually got um, a quasi overseas base in that we, um, Elvis has that opportunity to take the boys to for a long period of time. We've got a lot more players playing in Europe now as well um, professionally, probably not as many as we had um, back in the 2000s, but um, the AIS was basically an opportunity to bring the best players in to give them that daily training environment without having to, to send them overseas. And um, we knew before 85 that it was very difficult to bring the, the team together. But, uh, would you say that that was the golden era of men's water polo. We had our best results during that time from those people. And clearly the, when the junior program came along and Dumper was in charge, um, most of the national team players now came from that program. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in the centralized program. And I, I think that we've, <laughs> we've made a mistake in not continuing with the centralized program. And, and even when Dunka finished, I took over the juniors um, until it was wound up in two sticks. And I said at the time, um, this, we're not going to see the impact of this for another 10 years. And in 10 years' time, we'll start to wonder where our juniors are coming, where our senior players are going to come from, because we won't have that junior development <laughs> that is necessary to bring them through. And sorry, Noel, but I'll extend it. But other sports have done exactly the same thing and they've suffered. And one of the few sports that actually has persisted with a, an AIS program, they now call it a centre of excellence program, is basketball. And mm -hmm. they're kicking goals everywhere as far as their juniors and their seniors are going. Yeah, you look at the names that came out of that program, the Luke Longleys, the rest of them, etc. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great tragedy what happened. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so you said for better or for worse with the AIS program. What did you mean by the worse? Uh, whether or not it was the right model at the time. Um, as I said, there was, there was some criticism that players like myself probably stayed too long in the program and could have gone. If we had a better club competition and we didn't have a, a National League when the AIS started, the National League was basically developed through uh, or Charlie and Don were the the pushes behind it. and Noel obviously was involved with it, but um, there was nothing on a national scale except for the national championships. So um, when when it first started, there were players that were there for a long period of time. Maybe a better model is you bring them in, as we were doing with the juniors, for a, a cycle, an Olympic cycle or a junior cycle. And then you put them back out to the National League clubs or they go off overseas and, and pick up professional contracts. I think we've developed and, and um, being able to get a better model in place now. But the model at the time when the AS started back in 85 was the best. Okay. Foxy, when you were, Foxy, when you were um, obviously your time at the AIS and then um, more recently then, as well after that as the junior coach that took all of those athletes through um now back as the national youth coach national junior coach how have you found the the differing groups the 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 athletes of today versus the athletes of yesterday it's there's not a lot of difference in terms of when you get your hands on for a, a national program so uh yeah so i Unfortunately, we won't have the World Champs this year, but we were building up for um, the Youth World Champs in, in Istanbul in August. So I've been working with this group for, um, well, since October 2018. So I would have nearly had them for two years. And when players first came into the AIS, very similar standards. Um, they didn't have a great understanding of the game. They didn't have a great feel for the game. Some of them weren't fit in terms of being able to train on a daily basis. They just didn't have that uh, capability. But what the RAS gave them was that daily training environment and accelerated their learning and accelerated their development. What we get now with the junior program is we, we get to see them a lot, but we don't get to work with them a lot. And, over the 18 months that I've been in charge of this group, we've probably had four camps and one overseas tour, which was, and the overseas tour, which was only basically two and a half weeks. The development on that tour of players matched the development of the last year and a half. They just accelerated so much. So what we're missing out is that daily training, one-on-one -on -one contact, and the State Institute programs do a very good job, but what they don't do is bring the, all the players together. Mm. Okay. So building, building on that youth, I suppose, then, um, and probably uh, un, well, leading on to 2012, um, the Olympic team in 2012, we, we, you and I, you, as the head coach, um, we debuted a, a number of really young, youthful players that... Um, you know, came through the pathway, the AJ Roaches, the Aaron Youngers, those guys that have gone on to, you know, bigger and better things today. Um, you know, Aaron, fantastic player for Australia and recognised worldwide. Do you think that Australian water polo, we've always been on the younger, youthful end of, of teams because of, you know, non-professional contracts and, and those sorts of things here in Australia. Is that... Do you see that hurting us in the future or is that, you know, something that we just need to get over and move on? I know the National League's trying to become a little bit more professional about how they go. What are your views on that? It's a bit of both. Um, it was what I argued for in 2012 after um, London. We debuted seven players in yeah. London. And as you said, they came through the pathway. Um, we were the second youngest team in, young, in London, um, Great Britain being the only younger team than us on an average, and then we still lost players. So one of my concerns was that we weren't providing enough assistance for our, our national team players um, 
to be able to, to tour regularly. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really do believe that to match the Europeans and, and even the Americans do it, they go into camp for quite a long period of time. And if you can go into camp where you're um, able to travel and play against good competition, you're naturally going to get better. So to do that, you need money. I don't think that we've put our, our resources, our financial resources into um, best use over the last 10 years probably even more when we, we got rid of the AIS as well. So probably going back 15 years, I just think there's been a, a misappropriation of where we should be channeling some of our, our high performance money. And we are never going to be as lucky as the Europeans in terms of having that access to competition so readily. But when you look at the other side of the coin, they only get their national teams together for very short periods throughout the year. They might meet more often, but they don't actually train as a group until um, two to three months before a competition starts. So, for example, the Olympic year, most of the, the comps would be winding up now. We'd be going into a, a World League and then, and then you'd have your teams together. So, yeah, it's... Uh, there's not one easy answer, Paul. It's a, it's a mixture of both. But one thing I do know is that other national associations give much more assistance to their players than what Australia does. Boxy, um, I've just got a, a question for you. Um, the, as far as I know, there are, are three family members, your, your family members, that played water polo. Yourself, okay, Joe, who won a gold medal in Sydney, and your daughter, who was quite a talented young goalkeeper. Yes. Who was the best player? Oh, I'm going with Joe because she's got a gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an easy gold, gold, An Olympic gold medal, I'm not going to argue against that. Um, and, and just one other question. Um, because you've played for so many years at the highest level, who was the hardest centre forward you had to mark and why? Um, the hardest centre forward, and in my opinion, the best player that was going around in the, the 80s and the 90s was uh, Milanovic, Igor Milanovic from, oh, from Serbia. Okay. Yeah. And Yugoslavia at the time. And not only was he a centre forward that would damage you, he could score goals, but if he got the ejection so that the ball came in, you had to get kicked out. He would then, he wouldn't go on a post like most centre forwards do now and, and did back then. He'd go to the one position, an extra man, and he'd be the, the go-to man and he'd score from the one position. So he was, uh, he was outstanding in terms of just his ability to, to generate attacks for the Yugoslavs. And they won the gold medal in 84 and then 88 when I played. Uh, we didn't actually play against Yugoslavia, but then I did play against him um, in the lead-up tournaments and then he continued to play through to 91 at the World Champs. So, yeah, as far as I was concerned, he was the the best player, I think. The hardest player, and this might surprise you, hardest player I found was a little Spanish guy, uh, left-hander called Georgie Sands. Mm. And he was only, oh, he would have only been 180, 182 centimetres, and, but he was just slippery. I mean, not as in his skin, but I just couldn't grab a, I couldn't get a handle on him. And I was a centre forward that liked to, to grapple and hold. And, he just used to be able to slip away from me all the time. So as soon as I got on him, I'd be calling the zone straight back. <laughs> well, Foxy, Foxy yeah. sorry, mate. You, um, you said that you, you, your first one, your first one was 88. Can you just give us a, a brief rundown of all the lifts that you've done as a player, uh, going through them up to, to your start of coaching? Just so we know. Yeah, so, yeah, well, first Olympics was 88. Um, first... World Champs was 86, and that was when the World Champs were every four years. So um, 86 was Madrid. And um, so then we had 88 Olympics, 90, oh, we had a few World Cups in between there, but then 90 World Champs, which was 91 in Perth, um, 92 Barcelona, then 94 World Champs were in Rome, I think. Rome. Um, 
Rome, yeah. Yes. And then, yeah, unfortunately, um, well, most people know the story. '96, we were just—it was a, a travesty that we missed out on the Olympics, um, and they since changed the qualifying rules from after that. But um, we were going into to '96 as an informed team. We won the um, it was the Unicum or the something Cup in Hungary the year before. Um, beaten the Hungos and the the uh, the Croatians and so yeah we were, we were going in form and then we um, cut a long story short we left Australian summer and it was we left at the day we left in Sydney it was 42 degrees and we flew to Berlin for the the qualification and we arrived there it was minus 20 so it was a 60 degree turnaround in a day and uh, half the team got sick so we ended up playing most of the tournament. Well, we didn't play any of the, the games with the full team. And unfortunately, um, yeah, history will show that we lost that last game with Romania to qualify for um, for 96. So that was unfortunate. But then as a result of that, they changed the qualification. So now it's continental. Um, and then we went to 98 in um, Perth. And... That was with Irkin coaching and we finished fourth and that was our best result of the world champs. Now, you, you, can you comment on this, uh, Irkin? Um, he's a polarising sort of character. Either you love him or you hate him, I suppose. Uh, you finished your best ever in that, that series or that uh, the world championships and then he's gone. Yeah. 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 Um, it was a it was a strange one. Um, Erkin was a well, he, he is he's, he understands the game very well, and his training was exceptional in terms of that ability to get players uh, fit, moving in the water. He had some great uh, great drills, which I think this day to this day most of us use as part of our. our regular training regime. Um, he rubbed up players the wrong way at times um, and he, he certainly rubbed up a few of the, the the players to the point where they weren't enjoying the water polo and um, AFL, we've got Flavi here, uh, Paul, I understand. Um, there was a similar guy who took St Kilda to a grand final, Stan Ellis, <laughs> and uh, he got sacked straight afterwards as well. And um, it was a very similar situation where part of, part of uh, an Olympic or a world champs experience is not only to get the best out of you in terms of water polo, but you've got, you've got to enjoy the journey as well. And I think um, some of the players, they had a voice and I was the captain of that team and I became the, the spokesperson that was uh, responsible for trying to, to get the best out of everything, get the best out of the players. And now whether that helped me or not, because I was dropped after that um, when Camo took over. But um, yeah, that was, it was an unfortunate situation. But as you say, Minnie, he was, he was very, and remains a very talented um, coach. Erkin. So, um, John, I'm, I'm going to take you somewhere you may or may not want to go. So if you say no, it's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. Mate, I'm used to you um, taking places I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not bad, not bad. <laughs> um, the, you're the only coach in Australia's history to ever take two teams to the uh, quarterfinals of Olympic Games. You did it twice. You went to London. You had a good team. You were a little bit lucky early, but you were hard done by in the Serbian game. There's no doubt about that. Um, it wasn't your young players that let you down. It was the so-called experts that played in Europe didn't take the shots when they should. I'll call that, not you. How do you, how do you feel the way that you were treated? Because the people who have come after you have done a great job and they deserve great respect and great comments for that. But how do you feel the way you were treated? And, I, and I'll, I'll be you know, open here. We had lunches and we had chats afterwards because I was on the board after that and so forth. But how do, you, how do you feel the way you were treated? Because you done a great job and it wasn't the people you'd brought through that had let you down. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still at a bit of a, a loss as to understand 
how the decision for me not to continue was was well first made but then communicated because I had two meetings before that. Um, one was actually in London immediately after the the Serbia game and where we lost obviously to, to go through to the semi-final. And it was congratulations all around bad luck, but what and this was coming from the at the time the CEO and the high performance manager, what can we do so that we can take that next step? What can we provide you? And you know, I sort of alluded to the fact that we need to train more and mm -hmm. and I I said myself, you know, I would love to be able to get more experience with living with players overseas and using a European base. So that was fine. And then we had another meeting when we got back to Sydney. And again, it was, this was the review. Um, we could have done better here, here, but you did a really good job. And then two weeks after that, I went to N-Swiss. Um, I got a call to say, come up and have a meeting. Went to N-Swiss, actually coached the N-Swiss boys in the morning. And then um, went across for a meeting and basically it lasted five minutes and they said, oh, um, we're, we've decided not to go with you anymore. And so I didn't get any explanation. I still really haven't. And as you say, no, I've got no beef against Elvis. I think he's doing a fantastic job. Of course. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know whether a decision was made before, uh, whether something that happened between London and the meeting or there was negotiations happening. I really don't know, but um, what you say, it's interesting. I went on a bit of a holiday afterwards and I caught up with Terry Schroeder in, we went to US and he got sacked as well. Now he got a silver medal in Beijing and then we beat them for seventh, eighth place in, in London. And we were both just back and forth to each other over a few drinks and he goes, I feel like a criminal. And, I said, and he goes, I don't know what I've done, but I feel like I can't show my face anywhere. And I said, yeah, that's how I feel as well. I just don't know. I'm guilty of a crime, but I'm not sure what it is. So, yeah. So, so John, clearly you and your family are not criminals. You're welcome. You're always in water fire and always will be that way. But it's like, one of the things I've introduced in Pistol since I've got here is that we have two surveys retiring athletes and ongoing athletes and something water polo should do. Yeah, sure. Sure. And look, no, and I know I'm welcome back and I've been welcomed back by lots of people. And just the fact that I've been able to come back and be involved with the juniors um, and received a, an open arm invitation from certain people that have made the decision to allow me to back in. And, and Alex was it took obviously being one has been fantastic and, I've never lost the love for water polo. I just lost the love to be involved with, um, with, I suppose, some of the people that were making the decisions at the time. I just think sometimes oh, yeah. people need to remember very clearly that uh, no coach had ever taken anybody to a quarterfinal. Different structures, of course. You took them to two. And both times, very close. Yeah, exactly, Noel. And, so, and somebody very clever here has done uh, Foxy's coaching record with the uh, World Leagues and Olympics World Champs. We've got a third, a third, an eighth, a seventh, a sixth, a fourth, a, uh, a ninth, and a seventh, which, you know, in the, in the, in the scheme of things is pretty good, right? Uh, Foxy, I heard that interview that you, you gave to SEN after this decision. I heard it the other day occasionally we do some homework for this program yeah. in no way shape or form did you sound bitter and twisted as I think most people would have you were very you know as almost matter of fact about it uh, yeah Ian I suppose if you're going to get bitter and twisted about it um, and look I, I was hurting but um, that's not the forum to show it or, or to, to display it as well. I think that at the time I was still, I was proud of what our players had achieved and what we'd achieved as a coaching structure as well. And um, I, I suppose I, I still thought that there was an opportunity to be involved. And, and uh, I, um, Paul alluded to it 
earlier on that uh, a lot of these players, uh, you know, I, I love these guys and I still were very good friends with a lot of the boys that were from then and are still playing now. So, yeah, it was, it was um, mixed emotions, I suppose. But it was more, I just didn't know what the decision was based upon. So there was nothing to get too bitter about if you did oh, We're just losing John a little bit there. It's um, Canberra bubble. Canberra bubble. Canberra bubble. <laughs> so, John, so, John, you had a 61% winning average. I'd like to know what that is compared to other coaches. I think we've lost him. Oh, am I going? Yep. He's back. Are you back? Foxy. Okay, am I back? I'd be pretty close, I reckon. Right. No, hang on. Yeah, you good? Yeah. How am I going? Yeah, good. good. Yeah, you good now. Foxy, yeah. I can't believe it's better in Orange than it is in Canberra. I can't believe that. No. Um, 51%, I'm not sure. It, um, uh, I don't know so how it's... 60, no, 61. 61. 61. Yeah, 60.9. Oh, that's better. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Foxy, Foxy, when you, when you were coaching, um, did, did you have, or do you think you had a good rapport with the international referees? And if, if so, which, which one do you think you got on or was most confident was going to do your game you got on well with? Uh, as with coaches, other coaches and other players, I had a good rapport with some and some uh, I didn't like others and they didn't like me, I'm sure. Um, so I, in my opinion, the referees that were able to communicate, not just... Uh, be good referees, but be able to explain their decisions. So, to me, Margetta, um, he made mistakes, but he would communicate his mistakes and say, look, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. He would take responsibility for it. Um, whereas, oh, I'm not going to name names, but other referees, I, I thought, had their head stuck up their bum sometimes, and they, they knew they'd make mistakes, <laughs> and they wouldn't take responsibility for it. You're not and, talking about Noel, are you? <laughs> we all think it, don't worry. <laughs> hey, you leave Hollywood out of this, right? And um, you would never, you'd never blame a referee for, for any of your losses. And um, we were, uh, people mightn't remember, but the, the game against Montenegro in Beijing, where we drew, we had to win to go through to the, the, the semi finals. Um, a really poor refereeing decision cost us, and it was um, it wasn't a European; it was refereeing at the time. So it was, um, yeah. Look, you, I think the most important thing with the rapport with the referees is you're able to communicate with them, and you don't have to be their best mate. And you don't have to, um, you know, go out with them, but you do need to be able to talk to them. I think to be fair, John um, and Danny was still coming on in the Olympics in those days. Um, so I'll speak for Michael and myself, who were there before when you were coaching. You, you had the respect of the referees, especially the good referees. You had their respect. They didn't always agree with you, but they certainly no. respected you. Yeah. Well, no, I, I got quite a few yellow cards, but never one red card. So I'm you, proud of that. You're not, a, you're not a coach until you get a yellow card or like many, a red card because he holds his glasses up to referees. But Oh, well, I had to... Uh, the refereeing was appalling that day. I had to do the job. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I've got a, uh, one of, a question from the audience, Foxy. In, we're taking you back to London 2012. In the quarterfinal versus Serbia, right, Australia is leading 8-6 at three-quarter time. Do you think our Australian team got disadvantaged by the refs? Um unbalanced calls in brackets in any way in the fourth quarter considering this final score was 11-8 after it being 8-6 to us 11-8 Serbia won so it's 5-0 if my maths is correct at full time how yeah. do you feel about that particular game um yeah obviously we well, I relive that game all the time I've never watched a 
a replay of it, but I can tell you what happened. Um, to Serbia's credit, they switched their game up. And there was one player who was going to change that whole game and we had to shut him down. And that was um, Udovicic, Bunny Udovicic, the captain. And he came down, he swam down the middle of the pool from centre back, defended against, I think it was Beadsworth, swam all the way down. Uh, we didn't hit him, we're yelling out, screaming out, knock him down, knock him down, knock him down. Anyway, he swam into six metres, sat up, threw the ball straight over Joel's head. Um, and it certainly wasn't Joel's fault because he should have got knocked down, we should have forced it somewhere else. And that, that goal, I thought, just got their momentum going. That brought them back to even. And it, more or less, you could see our players go, oh, crap. Um, and then it was a, a battle for two or three minutes. They, they got a goal in front. And then, obviously, to win the game, <clears throat> because there was no use in, in having a, a one-goal loss, we, we tried to, to um, do a few things to get the goal back there. Yeah, that, they changed their game, and, and it, I think it was the one player that did that. Was he just took the, the ball by the horns? He did a, a Michael Jordan basically, and said, "I'm going to drag this team across the line." So you're not blaming the referees? No. So, no. so John, you're being a bit modest here. I, as you know, Michael and Hart and myself were sitting in the stands watching this game in London. Um, tactics were good, players were good. It was a bit of unluck. The referees, they were okay. They didn't really do anything bad. But some of your very senior players didn't do what they should have done. No, and look, maybe the the, the situation was um, looking up at the scoreboard thinking about the result rather than the process. One thing that did annoy me, Noel, though, was at three-quarter time, Lonzi, who was um, in charge of the, the TWPC, sitting on the table, sent a table official around to our bench to tell our goalkeeper to stop yelling out and directing play because he was talking and communicating too loud. And that, I think, I believe that upset Joel immensely. Yeah, one of the problems with Gianni is, and I, I actually quite like him, he's done a great thing, a lot of great things for water polo, but there were some things that weren't perhaps the best for water polo. And that's probably one of them. Yeah, there was no rule in the book to say that our goalkeeper wasn't allowed to shot, uh, talk and direct traffic. Which, we, which was an instruction I wanted him to do. He was our communicator in defence. So, yeah. One, one, of the, one of the good things with, with Vim and Mark in charge now, I don't think you'll ever see that again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, we're, uh, time is uh, against us as usual because we could talk all night, I'd suggest. It's been a fascinating uh, session with Foxy. Uh, the opinion... Uh, session for our guest always. The best coach, John, you've coached against, why? Um, interesting one here. Spanish coach, Rafa Regula. And the reason being because I thought he only had an average team and he would get the best out of them at major international tournaments. So he was... Uh, he respected his players and we got on with the Spanish quite well. We had quite a few players playing in Spain. And yeah, the, the, the players spoke of the coach in great awe. And to me, he always showed me respect, but he was also um, very humble. Well, he, might, he won most of the time against us, but he was, uh, yeah, to me, he, he got the best out of his players. So that's why I think he's one of the best coaches. Good coaches get uh, good things out of their players. Now, you might have answered it, but it doesn't have to be a centre forward. The best player you've played against? Oh, I think, yeah, I think it was Milanovic. Okay. All right, you answered that a little bit earlier. Yeah, How I suppose about... the best player I've coached against, though, yeah. would be um, Filipovic. He's probably the best player I've seen in terms of just broad skill and talent. I think he's won the World Water Polo player of the year twice, maybe three times. Okay. So, 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 John, one quick question. Sorry to cut in on Ian here. There is many examples in the world where a coach has worked in, the, in an area, they got away, they come back and they did it again. They're very successful. What would you do different this time? 
if you had the chance again? Good question. Uh, yeah, it is a good question. Um, player management, I would just take a, a little bit more a different approach and you learn. Uh, now, I was probably only a novice when I, I started even at the, the Olympics in, in 08. Um, just that ability to, I think, now more than ever, players are demanding one-on-one, -on -one, and I find this with teaching as well, um, just that one-on-one -on -one communication and sitting down, talking them through. Uh, you're thinking, you're talking and instructing, and you're thinking that everyone's on the same page as you, but you understand that they're not. So just that ability to, to communicate and, and relate to the players, I think, is crucial. How about that uh, generational gap? An older coach with younger players. Uh, look, I've been through it so often. Um, they, it's almost like you have to entertain your players now rather than just going, okay, this is what you do, just go and do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, a bit of that. Um, and that's why you do need your your team leaders. They're, they're a crucial part of your, your, um, your coaching network, I suppose, because... It's through those guys that you are able to communicate and link with the, the, the younger generation. So, um, and as I said, I find it with school now, with teaching, I only teach year 11 and 12, but um, yeah, it's just that ability to communicate and connect. And I think you, you learn and it's just like refereeing, you, you learn as part of the journey that you go through. So um, we've got players, uh, coaches rather that, have been in all kinds of sport for a long time. And you ask Wayne Bellamy, he's still learning as a coach. He's still developing. So, so John, I, I want to ask you and Paul a very direct question because I know how it works in referees. Um, I'm Scott and Danny agree. The older referees who have been in the Olympics and the rest of them, they help each other. They do everything they can to mentor each other. But it doesn't seem to me that happens in coaching. And I may be wrong. Do you guys feel that a, a mentoring problem, uh, a program in coaching would help because there's certainly does in refereeing. John Whitehouse, Chooker Bird, Phil Bauer, all of them helped me along the way. Danny's been helped, he knows that, so Scott. That's how it works. It's a smaller group, yep. but that's how it works. Do you think that's really critical in coaching? Works overseas too, no? Hungry do it. I've been doing Absolutely. It um, I, I'm assuming that they do it in other part, well, certainly Italy do as well, but um, I would assume Croatia, Serbia, they do it too. But I know that the Hungarians do it. Um, you know my, my contact with Kemeny and he explains the, the coaching uh, structure in Hungary. His dad was still involved as a, a mentor until a short time ago as, as part of the junior team. And then even going away last year, so Hungary seeing ex players and coaches still involved with the development of their junior teams. Um, yeah, so it's something that I put my hand up and said I was absolutely more than happy to assist with mentoring when I finished after 2012. But yeah, um, so yeah, I suppose this is one way that we're looking at mentoring by me being involved with the juniors. We talk about it, but we don't do it. Okay, <coughs> now the best referee you have observed you don't have to answer that, Foxy. And <laughs> certainly not you, Noel. Foxy. Oh, Flavi, it's going to be Flavi. <laughs> <laughs> him either. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> are, you, are you talking observed on pool deck? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I remember seeing an email saying you can't pick Flavi. <laughs> I would no, I spoke about Magetta. I, I, I think um, Magetta is, is probably one of the better ones. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I agree. No, no, just going back to your question to Foxy as well there, um, before about the coaching and the mentors. I think the crying shame out of water polo here in Australia is that you can become the national coach and the day that you don't have that job, it's, you're dropped. There is, there is nothing there for you. There is no support mechanisms for you. You're not looked at for next teams. You're not looked at anything. You know, there's been so many coaches like that that they've got this wealth of experience that it's we don't brilliant. tap into. And, and dumpers in the same boat. Correct. You know, there's Charlie Turner, there's Erkin, there's you know, Don Cameron, there's all of the, a mini. You know, there's, there's everyone that's out there that 
has been a national coach. And they've been put in as a national coach because they're a good coach and they know what they're doing. But for some reason, you know, we, we well, Water Polo Australia, Water Polo in Australia, we always seem to move on very quickly and go, well, no, that's not what we want anymore and we move on. Maybe you know, watching you know Paul, that's a, that's, that's a great answer, Paul. And the, the question was to both of you, and if I went out to the water polo community and said, the senior referees all look after each other, but the coaches don't mentor each other, they'd laugh at me. Mm. But that's exactly how it is. You are 100% correct. That's what needs to happen. That's what happens in other sports. People care for our country. They want to help each other. They want to help each other. It doesn't matter whether you are coaching 30 years ago or now. There's only one thing we care about is winning Olympic gold medals. All of us do. And the coaches need to be supported, especially the ex-coaches. Thank you, Noel. And uh, rather than being demeaned about your glasses. Okay, and uh, Foxy, because <laughs> Foxy, we've got lots of girls and ladies uh, <laughs> watching. The best female player, I don't know if you paid a lot of attention to them, best female, female player you've seen? Uh, it would have to be Maggie Stephens from USA, best player in the best team in the last 10 years. So she, uh, she certainly stands out, I believe. Well, we could talk all night, John. You've been, it's been absolutely fascinating. We appreciate your time. And uh, you never know, because we could obviously talk a lot more, <laughs> you never know, we might do it again one day. But thank Sounds you. Sounds great. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. On the whistleblower, we've gone way over time, gentlemen. Noel Harrod, Paul Overman, Danny Flav, Scotty Schweichel, and our special guest, John Fox. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in a fortnight's time on The Whistleblower.